wonderful to see you all back this evening. Uh, quickly, before we begin, uh, please remember Sister Sharon Justice in your prayers. Uh, she's been admitted to Skyline. We think something uh, might have bit her on her hand. Uh, so uh, they're looking into that, but she is uh, being treated at Skyline now. So keep her in your prayers this week, please. It was one sunny afternoon. A little boy had a wad of money burning a hole in his pocket, as we say. Mama told him he worked hard for that money, he can buy anything he wants. So he goes down to the corner store and buys a bag full of candy. Can't wait to tear into it, so he sits down on the curb, just one piece after another. Gentleman comes by, uh, observes the youngster doing what he's doing, just having a big old time, and he says, young man, that's uh, not a good way to eat. Bad for you. The little boy looked up at him. He said, sir, my grandfather lived to the ripe old age of 95. The man looked at him, puzzled, and asked, by eating candy like this? He said, no, by minding his own business. That's what we're going to talk about tonight, minding your business. God has his business, and we have ours. That's the dynamic I'm looking at tonight. What he has done, will do, is supposed to do, in conjunction with our responsibility. Because they certainly complement one another, and you're going to see that this evening. But also, you know, sometimes we try to take hold of what is clearly God's purpose in this world. First off, it was God's business to send his son. Let's look at Isaiah 53, please. Fantastic passage, prophecy, where it's speaking of Jesus Christ. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 through 3. The chapter itself is beautiful. It's one of my favorite passages to read. It's excellent to read uh, during the Lord's Supper. because It speaks a great deal about uh, the prophetic utterance of Jesus and the sufferings that he would endure. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Beautiful passage. Prophesy how God is going to send his son. Throughout the chapter, it talks about how he would suffer, how he was the suffering servant. We also read of this sacrifice in John chapter 3, very beautiful passage. John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten, that he gave his one and only, that he gave his precious only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Certainly judgment is a part of God's nature, about what he is promising to do, and we'll talk about that in a little while, but when God sent His Son, it was for the express purpose of bringing salvation to mankind. Because our Heavenly Father said, for, for there to be forgiveness of sins, blood must be shed. And that's what happened in the Old Testament, under the Old Law, when animals were slaughtered for their lives so that the sins could be forgiven, but it was an imperfect system. It was an imperfect system, so God sent His Son to be that perfect sacrifice for all of mankind so that the world might be saved through Him. And this was God's business. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, also another beautiful passage, but God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were sinners, while we were living on our own for ourselves, while we were being selfish and greedy, and lustful, and prideful. Christ died for us during that moment. 
And it is up to us, though, to come to him, for that is our business that we should be minding. For it is man's business to believe in the Son. John chapter 8 and verse 24. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Sin separates us from God. Jesus is acknowledging that fact at this point. You will die in your sins unless you believe in me. Unless you follow me. More on that later. But unless you do that, you will die in your sins. It is our business. It is our responsibility to believe in the Son of God. John 12, chapter 12, and verse 48. He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. There are people whom reject God. And this verse shows us that those who reject him, you know, they'll be judged someday. All of us will be judged, but what about that one? What about those who are rejecting God? What about those people? Let's look, please, at John chapter 6, verses 66 through 68. It is God's business to send His Son. He's handled that. We don't have to do anything in that respect, but what we do have to do is believe in His Son who was sent, develop a faith, develop a strong connection with Him. John 6 and verse 66. As a result of this, many of His disciples withdrew and were not walking with Him anymore. It's becoming too difficult for the people to stay committed to Christ. So they start to walk away from him. So Jesus said to the twelve, You do not want to go away also, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. We have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. It was Peter's, the other disciples. Our responsibility today to believe in Jesus Christ and to follow him. He's done his part. We must do ours. Next, it was, sorry, that don't, went above the page there, but it was the Holy Spirit's business to give us the Bible. 2 Peter chapter 1, 20 and 21. But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. To reflect back on what I spoke on this morning, we are to follow the Word of God. It is to be taught. We must learn from it and apply it in our lives. Here, Brother Peter is saying no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. We say that a lot now, don't we? Well, the Holy Spirit inspired the writers to write down what he wanted them to write. But a lot of times people will say, well, that's your interpretation. That is a good discussion to have because we do need to be careful of that. Because we put our own bias a lot of times onto a passage. We want to make sure that we're letting the Bible speak to us, not us speak to the Bible. We've got to be careful of that, all of us do. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. The matter of inspiration is a beautiful thing. As you get into it deeper, you see how the Holy Spirit used different men and the experiences they had and, and they wrote in particular ways to particular people. And it's a beautiful thing. It was the Holy Spirit's business, though, to speak to these men and to give us the Word of God. It is man's business to accept the Bible and to follow it, to not change it. Deuteronomy 4 and verse 2, You shall not add to the Word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. A lot of people out there, maybe wanting to add to, maybe wanting to take away, maybe want to change things. These, these are just old ideas. You know, we got, we got to get with the times. No, 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 no. We have got to follow the Bible as it is written, as we know it at this moment, following it to the very best way that we can. Because that is our business. Not to improve press upon certain beliefs, but to look at what the Bible says, to take from it. That's what Brother Danny was talking about 
a week or so ago when he was talking about the restoration movement. That's what the people wanted at the time. And it was a good thing to want. They said, we've got enough, we have had enough of man's own interpretation, of man changing things, of man adding to the word, of man doing things, and us being like, well, that's not in the Bible. Barton W. Stone, Alexander Campbell, Raccoon John Smith, they all had, had enough of that. And they said, we're going to get back to the Bible. We're going to see what it says. And we're going to act where the Bible says we should act and speak where the Bible says we should speak, and we will be silent where it is silent. Because we don't need to add to it. We don't need to take away from it, because these are the commandments of the Lord our God. It is our business, our responsibility to follow the Bible. Galatians chapter 1, let's turn there. Galatians 1, verses 6 through 9. Talk this morning about how there are different beliefs, there are different religions, you know. Mankind, we're not perfect. But thankfully, we have a perfect Savior. And if you go to, He'll make you complete. And He'll save you in this earth, and He'll save you and take you on into eternity in the next life. But here, Paul is writing to the church at Galatia, trying to get them to understand what they're supposed to be about. Here, the church, it might be an understatement, to say that the church was in its infancy. Very, very new. But look at what's happening. Galatians 1, 6 through 9. I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. The ink on the papyrus isn't, isn't even dry yet. And people are starting to develop new beliefs. They're starting to develop new ways of thinking when the, when the scripture is, is right there. Paul's barely written this letter. Those the Christians in Galatia, they're, they're following other people. They're following other gospels. Paul is warning them of that. Don't follow these other gospels. Verse 7, which really is not another. He's admitting there are people that are teaching other gospels, but he says, you know what? There's only one true gospel. That's what verse 7 is about. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. They want to change it. They want to make it suit their needs. They want to make it more palatable for the masses. Whatever the motivation was, we can definitely see it today as people want to distort the gospel. They want to change it and make it something different. Verse 8. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. So if there's, if Paul's up there, you know, preaching, and he's visiting the church of Galatia and leaves, and there's a, another gentleman that comes up and preaches a different gospel, Paul says, you better watch out for him. He's preaching another gospel. If I preach to you a different gospel, if my message, he says, is not consistent, is not agreeing with, with what is being taught, you know, you need to call me on it, Paul even says there in verse 8. Verse 9, as we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. Man doesn't get this business right very often. But may, may we here do our very best to adhere to the scriptures as they were written, as close as, as we possibly can. And may we be open to discuss these matters. Talk about what we must do, what the church should be about its business, and how it should operate so that we might teach others and show others the true light of Jesus Christ. Next, it was also the Holy Spirit's business to give us the plan of salvation. As we look throughout Scripture, you can garner several examples of where people wanted to know what they had to do where people wanted to know what they had to do to be saved, to be accepted into the body of Christ. And throughout Scripture, these are the examples of what we see nearly each and every time. And they are reflected in each passage in one way or another. This is the plan of salvation. We are to hear the Word of God. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17 tells us. You should hear it. It's not just going to come to you as, a, as an epiphany, as a, as a revelation. 
but rather it's going to come to you because you studied. It's going to come to you because somebody taught you, because somebody sat down with you and said, here is the Word of God, here's what the New Testament teaches about New Testament Christianity, with which Christ died for and established when he was living on this earth before he arose into heaven. You hear the Word of God. Then what, you, what do you do? You believe, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. You believe what you are hearing. The eunuch did this very same thing. And so did so many others. The people in Acts chapter 2, they heard Peter preaching. And then they believed in what was being said to him. And then they repented. Luke chapter 13 and verse 3, where Jesus says, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Don't worry about what other people are doing, whatever you think you've done or might have done, but unless you repent, unless you turn from your sin and start a new life, you will perish. He actually repeats himself in verse 5. That's how important it is. You can't hear the word of God, in other words. You can't believe it and then expect to keep living however you want. Scripture does not teach that. It does not teach that you can live however you want if you just believe. Even the demons believe, don't they? Even the demons believe and tremble. This is what the Holy Spirit has told us through the good book. And we can't throw out any of these matters. Hear, believe, repent, confess. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 32. Not confess of our sins, although I know why you think that, but rather confess that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Because the good passage says, if you confess me before men... That person, you, will I confess before my Father who is in heaven. So you make a public statement that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he died to take away your sins. And then next, we read of being baptized. When the people asked, men and brethren, what shall we do? In Acts chapter 2, they said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what they said. It's so what they said when they, asked, when they asked the question. Peter said, repent, he says that there, and be baptized. Why? Because they've heard, because they believe, and they're, they're repenting because it says they were pierced to the heart. They were sorry for what they had done and how they had treated Jesus and how they neglected him and how they've been living their lives. Repentance is even there in Acts chapter 2. And then those souls were baptized on that day, 3,000 souls then we can't forget about Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10 where it talks about living faith. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, the men wrote these passages giving us today the plan of salvation. And it is man's, it is man's duty to obey the plan. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? What will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel? If you have not obeyed the gospel, if you are not a New Testament Christian, Peter is asking, I am asking, your loved ones are asking, what will become of your soul? What will happen to your soul if you do not obey the gospel of God. And come forward in just a little while and be baptized or see me afterwards. We can make that happen. For it is man's business to obey the plan of salvation. It was Christ's business to start the church. Matthew 16, 18, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. We also read Acts chapter 20. Verse 28, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. This is why Christ came to earth, to save us from our souls, to, to start an institution where people would come together and, and teach the same thing and, and be of the same mind. And it was his business to start his church that he died for and that he gave his life for. It is man's business to comply with the teachings of the Bible regarding the church. 
to not find a church of his own, but to look to the scriptures, to look to this ancient book that has been proven right time and time again and adhere to the teachings of the Bible regarding the church. Matthew chapter 15 says this, Then the disciples came to him and said, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this statement? One of the many times Jesus offended the Pharisees. But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father did not plant shall be uprooted. That's why it's so very important that what is said from this pulpit, that what is said from the, from the classes, what is said in your homes about Scripture is a plant that the Heavenly Father would endorse. Why? Because it comes from the teachings of the Bible. Not, well, I feel this way or, or I think this way. What does the Bible say? That's where our teachings come from. That's where our wisdom comes from. And that's where we should go. Everything that we say or think should be filtered through that. What's the Bible say? about that topic. And one way or another, it's going to handle it. Let them alone. The Pharisees, he says, let them alone. There are blind guides of the blind. Many people don't understand that. I say my middle, to my middle schoolers, that's like the blind leading the blind. They're like, what are you talking about? But that's, that's what this is. When you've got Pharisees who are trying to say Jesus is wrong, trying to adhere to the old ways that Jesus has actually come to fulfill they said, we don't need to listen to that man, the Christ, even though he's walked on water, turned water into wine, healed people, made people to, to speak, and, and made them see. We don't need to listen to him. They don't need to listen to us, they say. And it still goes on today, where the blind is leading the blind, because if a blind man guides a blind man, both will fall into the pit. So who's leading you? Who's leading your family? I hope it's Christ. I hope it's the wisdom of scriptures. I hope that you're always on the lookout for evil things that, that might creep in and might try to steal your heart <coughs> or hurt important relationships that are in your home. But it is our business to adhere to the teachings of the Bible. It is the Lord's business to judge. John 5 and verse 30, Jesus says, I can do nothing on my own initiative. While he was here, it wasn't about him, but rather it was about him with his connection to the Father. This is one example. <clears throat> As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46, give us a wonderful picture, or a scary picture, depending on where you might find yourself that day of judgment where the sheep are on the right and the goats are on the left. And Jesus says to those on his right hand, you know, come to me. And then to those on his left, he says, I never knew you. I never knew you because it is his business to make that judgment. That's a tough pill for people to swallow today. We don't like judging things. You know, we don't like being a judge of things, but, you know, we judge things all the time. We judge things we put in our mouths. You know, it's a normal normal part of life, you know, what we eat, how we live, we make judgments all the time. So ultimately, though, the righteous judge will judge us where our souls will go for eternity. But sometimes humans, us men, ladies, we get it mixed up. It is not our, jo it's not our job to judge, but it is our business, it is our job to preach and to obey what the scripture teaches. Let's look, please, at Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. It is God's business to judge. It is man's business to preach and to obey. Matthew 7, beginning with verse 1. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard of measure it will be measured to you. In other words, as we look at people and say, ha, look how she's living. Look how he's living. I can't believe they live like that. Well, we know where they're going. Doing that judging stuff that we're so good at. Jesus says here, be careful how you judge. 
because we don't think about ourselves very much, do we? When we're doing that same judging, we're, we're perfect, or I just made a, made a slight mistake, or that was just a, a slight indiscretion. Not a big deal. But yet we condemn other people for doing the exact same thing many times. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite! First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. It's, you know, when we see people who are struggling, who are suffering because of their behavior, it's a good thing. Certainly teachings in Scripture where, hey, we're to reach a brother or a sister who's living wrong. We're to reach out to them to try to bring them back to the fold, bring them back to Christ. And I believe that's what verse 5 is saying. You know, don't, don't try to take the speck out when you've still got the log in your eye. What does it say? First, take the log out. Take the log out first. Admit your own shortcomings. See where you're messing up. See how you need Jesus so much. And when you do that, you can better see to help your brothers, to help your sisters with the speck that is in their own eye. Because we need that. We do need that. When people are suffering, when they're struggling because of sin, sometimes they need a good, strong, loving brother or sister to say, Hey, what are you doing? What are you doing? Is there any way that I can help? Because our struggling brothers and sisters, they don't need judgment. They don't need ridicule. They don't need a hypocrite breathing down their neck. What they need is someone who knows their business, someone who understands their business in Christ, and they're preaching it, they're obeying it, they're praying for that lost soul to come back to Christ. You, you may have a difficult time with that log, but I hope you get it out of the way. And I hope that you're able, again though, to help those brothers and sisters who do have the spec. Because indeed we need that, but ultimately, leave the eternal resting place of our souls, leave that judging to the professionals. Because our Heavenly Father is the just and righteous judge, and He can handle that just fine. But our own business is to be obedient to the One who came and suffered and died for us. And we must remember that. So mind your business in this life. Your business might tonight might be uh, including becoming a Christian. And if you're not a Christian, I hope you'll become one. And think about the business that you should be about, the business of obeying Jesus Christ, because He has that standard for you to live for Him and, and Him alone. Or if you need prayers of forgiveness, prayers of strength. I hope that you'll let us assist you with that as well. Won't you come now as we stand and sing?